Remember our Lord, he wept over Jerusalem because they didn't know the day of their visitation. And I believe that we do know together the day of our visitation. And uh, it is at hand and the Lord's going to move in our midst. And let's be praying at every opportunity. Whenever you have five minutes, let's be praying. Let's be uh, coming to what we can uh, in the prayer meetings and uh, seeing what God will do uh, in these days in our midst. Now let's uh, turn in our Bibles um, to the book of Joshua and chapter 1. I'm just really following on from what Dan was saying. And we've spoken of the foundations of vision. And we're beginning to speak of the enemies of vision. And we mentioned one of them last night, which was secret sin. And uh, Dan has now mentioned another uh, six or seven. And so I've come to number eight or nine. But that's, uh, that's how it is when the Lord is here, uh, that things flow together. But I just want to uh, pick up one thought here. Perhaps you turn your page back to Deuteronomy chapter 34. Okay. And verse 7, Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his strength gone. And the Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days, nearly a whole month of mourning for him, until the time of weeping and mourning was over. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. Over to Joshua chapter 1. And verse 2. Okay. Verse 2. The Lord says to Joshua. Moses my servant is dead. Now that's interesting isn't it? They've just had 30 days of mourning. Okay. That's a long time. Okay. That's a whole month. They've not had normal activities. They've just been mourning. I'm not quite sure what you do in a month of mourning. It seems a long time for me. But obviously, you know, they knew what to do. And so it's over now. And uh, Joshua gets before the Lord. It's his morning devotions or whatever. And he says, now, Lord, speak to me. And the Lord says, Moses, I just want you to know that, sorry, Joshua, I just want you to know that Moses has died. Sorry, Lord, you know, would you mind repeating the message, you know, for me? Moses, Joshua, is dead. Now, the Lord is not in the business of being superfluous in what he has to say. And why was it after a whole month of mourning that the Lord tells Joshua something he knows very, very well, that Moses was dead? It is simply for this reason that it was time for Joshua to grasp that now his day had come. And you see, that is what Dan has been pressing on us. And that's what the Holy Spirit is pressing on us. The reason we look back is that we might seize our day of opportunity today. And it's wonderful, and, and we will refer back to something of the vision of this place over the last 45 years. And I can't go through a conference without making reference to people like Ted Hegry and others that were some of my spiritual fathers. But Ted is dead. Now we know that he's with the Lord. But why the Lord said it was simply now, Joshua, this is your day. And you see, I love to read about the revivals. Reading about revivals, you know, is just for me. Some people like to lie on the beach, and some people like to climb mountains, and some people like to go to McDonald's. I like to read about revivals, okay? But, you know, that just kind of keeps me, keeps me going. And when, you know the story of the Welsh revival, when Evan Roberts was praying and praying, and they were seeking God, and it was late one night, they'd been praying for a long time, and his mother said, Evan, I'm going home. And he said, Mother, don't go. Tonight, the Holy Spirit is coming. And she said, I must go. He said, Mother, don't go. Tonight, the Holy Spirit is coming. And the Holy Spirit came with such power 
that in that tiny country of Wales, this is 1904, in 20 months, just 20 months, 200,000 people were converted. The police didn't have anything to do. They didn't have any crime to report. The taverns all shut. They went out of business. Even, you know, down in the pits, the pit ponies uh, used to operate in the darkness because they didn't have uh, mechanized, uh, mechanized uh, machines down there to pull the coal, you know, along in the carts. And they, you know, to, to get a pony to turn left, they would curse. To get it to turn right, they would use another particular form of cursing. To get it to stop, they would use yet another curse, swearing, you know, at them. This is the way they live. Well, when all these miners got converted, they went down the pits, and the ponies, they didn't understand them. They would say, stop, and they would keep going, because they'd only learned to respond to profanity. And the mines were in chaos. They couldn't work, because the profanity had stopped, and the poor ponies didn't know what to do. <laughs> Praise the Lord, serves them right. <laughs> but that, you see, now we love, we love to look back to the days of the great revivals, we love to look back at the times when the Holy Spirit has fallen in this very auditorium. But Moses is dead. Joshua, it's your day. And people of God in this room, it is our hour. This is our conference. And our God wants to come. Let me have an amen, please, at this point. That's right. He wants to come. And now he says, next verse, he says, now, Get ready to cross, verse 4, and he tells him, your territory will extend from the desert to the Lebanon and from the great river Euphrates, all the Hittite country down to the great sea, and so on. And no one, no one of all those enemies that Dan has listed, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Now, please, we've got to be terribly serious with the Lord because some people in this room, you are in the grip of unbelief because there have been things that have been so bonded to you over the years that you simply think you will never break through in the way that we're outlining. You will. You will. And this, this morning, the Holy Spirit is saying that none, none, of those enemies will be able to stand against you. This is your Kadesh Barnea. This is your time to go in. Joshua, this is your day. Seize it. Grasp it. And then the Lord tells him that he is giving him territory. And you know, the Holy Spirit wants to whisper in your heart and say, I'm giving you territory. Now that might be a particular town where you live might be a particular neighborhood where you live it might be a continent Reinhard Bonnke is a man that we've come to know and love uh, you perhaps know this lovable uh, booming uh, German uh, and it's very interesting that Bonnke um, I guess goes back to the Welsh revival now Bonnke ministers in Africa I'm sure you know his story he has the largest tent in the world it holds 30,000 people. But now he can't have crusades in the tent very often because usually they get 200,000 people coming to the meetings, as is in his great crusade from Cape Town to Cairo. And just again, uh, that sense of the, the work of God going into the new generation that Dan was speaking about. Reinhard Bonnke was at the Swansea Bible College just as a young man. That was where Rhys Howells ministered. And uh, he was going back to Germany. He was 21 years old, going back to Germany. And he was in London. He had to wait for his train. And he was wandering around. And he saw a little sign on a house. And it said, George Jeffries. And he thought, I wonder if this is the George Jeffries. Because Evan Roberts, in one of his meetings, there was a minor converted called George Jeffries and his brother, and those men, after the Welsh revival, had a healing ministry like our nation has never seen again this century. And this timid 21-year-old boy knocked on the door. And this uh, 
this uh, lady, uh, obviously some sort of nurse, opened the door and he said, is this the home where the George Jeffreys lives? And the nurse said, yes, it is, but he doesn't see anybody these days. He's very ill. Well, but then somebody came tottering up the hall because he had heard uh, that uh, somebody, not, and he could hear the strange accent. And he came to Bonky, and he didn't say anything. He simply laid his hands on him and said, Lord, now the anointing that I've known and the anointing that I've seen and the anointing that I've carried, let it be on this man in Jesus' name. Didn't say any more. And Bonky went off. Years later, he woke up in his tent in South Africa. He was just a, a missionary. Nothing spectacular. Nothing to write home about. He'd been doing it for years. And he woke up in the night and the Holy Spirit was saying, I wish I could preach like George Whitfield, who when he preached, he could cry uh, without it affecting his voice and the tears would just be streaming down his face as he was preaching, but I can't. And he woke up and the Holy Spirit was saying to him, Africa shall be saved, Africa shall be saved, Africa shall be saved. And it burnt into him and he said, Lord, I've got to get a tent. He bought the biggest tent he could, held about 500 people and he started to preach and this was born in his spirit uh, a burden that a continent would be saved and that man carries it with him day and night and if you've met him if you know him and love him you know it's not it's not being cavalier at all but it's vision that's been deposited in his spirits now Moses my servant is dead Joshua, it's your day. It's your hour. William Carey is in heaven. Hudson Taylor is in heaven. George Whitfield is in heaven. John Wesley is in heaven. Ted Hegri is in heaven. It is our day. It's our Kadesh Barnea. Okay? And the Lord is giving us territory. Now, we've been speaking of some of the territory he wants to give you in these days. And Dan's just outlined Seven areas of territory. Make sure you lay hold. It might be that the Holy Spirit will wake you up at four o'clock this morning. And he will speak to you about the city where you live. Or the neighborhood where you live. And the Holy Spirit will say, I'm giving this to you. Might be that you've been seeking God about a ministry in a certain area. Perhaps in the area of healing. And the Holy Spirit will wake you up and say, I'm giving you this territory. And yes, it's wonderful to have spiritual fathers like Moses and Ted Hegri and others, but they're dead. And it's our day. It's our hour. And we've got to lay hold. Amen? Amen. 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 Right. Now we'll get back to the message. Don't worry. We'll get there. We'll get there in the sense of what God wants us to, to do. And I've mentioned one enemy of disappointments last night, and that was secret sin. And now I'm going to mention three or four more, probably, before we close out the morning. Because when vision is birthed in your hearts, when the Holy Spirit says, I'm giving you territory, whatever that might be, the enemy comes out against you to withstand you taking it. Okay, and we know that. The enemy came out against Israel, and there were some areas of the land that they never really got a hold of until the days of David. So we mentioned one enemy. Now I want to mention several more. I said number one, secret sin. Number two, disappointments, betrayal, and criticism. Disappointment, betrayal, and criticism. If you have a vision, okay, in the fulfillment of it, you will have to move through disappointments. We went out to Cyprus two years ago, and the first year was wonderful. Everything, everything exploded in the very best sense of the world. Pe people got converted, Arabs and Cypriots and international community, without us even trying. They just seemed to fall into the kingdom. And it's wonderful when that happens, and uh, it's lovely. 
and the next year everything, everything collapsed. My dear brother Costas, who was my, one of my co-workers, I think the most gifted personal evangelist I've ever worked with. He was a professional gambler all his life, converted, uh, he, he left Cyprus as a boy, uh, gambled uh, for the whole of his professional life. He was a Cypriot in the West End of London. He worked at night, he slept in the day. He knew no other profession than gambling. Then the Holy Spirit got a hold of him and he was transformed overnight and became one of the best personal evangelists I've ever worked with. That year he got cancer, terminal cancer, and despite all our fasting and praying and all the miracles we'd seen before, he died just over a year ago. And we lost him. The enemy came and I was bitterly disappointed. Our leading Arab convert, a man named Naji, who was always with us in evangelism, he got sick. And for six months, he went from doctor to doctor, and they couldn't even diagnose what he was sick with. In the midst of all this chaos, I got ill for two months. In the midst of that, a man moved in who was a false prophet, and most of our converts actually left with him. And things were collapsing all around us. Now, when you've got vision, the enemy comes out against you, and you've got to stand your ground. Now, what I want to say is that this year, God is giving us it all back. I had such a bad year in 1988 that when I came into 89, I said, Lord, this year, I'm going to give the devil a really bad time. I'm going to give the devil a bad year, okay? And the Lord's been recovering the ground. But if you've got vision, you've got to go through disappointment. Now, there are people in this room, and you're deeply disappointed. Now, you've got to get that cleaned out of your spirit, otherwise it's going to blight vision. You won't dream dreams and see visions anymore. It's been blighted. It's been atrophied. It's wasted away. You've got to get it cleaned out of your spirit. Disappointment, number one. Betrayal, number two. I was speaking to a colleague of mine recently. And I said to him, John, how's the church going? He was the leader of a very fast-growing church. I won't say where it is, for obvious reasons. And he said, I'm shattered. I said, what's wrong? He said, well, he said, a couple of weeks ago, um, the, the owner of the property we meet in phoned me up. It was a cinema. They met. Uh, this was a growing church. They met in a cinema. And he said, he phoned me up. And he said, you owe us $20,000 rent. I said, it must be, he said, John said, it must be a computer error. We pay every month. So he said, I'll come down in the morning with our treasurer and we'll sort it out. So he made an appointment for 9 o'clock the next morning. At 8.45, his treasurer phoned him and said, John, over the last 12 months, I've embezzled $30,000 of church money. Now, it wasn't the money, brothers and sisters. It was the betrayal. It was the pain. Now, some of you out there today... You've been betrayed, okay? It might have been a husband, it might have been a wife, it might have been an employer, it might have been a Christian leader, okay? And sometimes the greatest betrayal is when Christian leaders let us down because we stand before and we will be judged the more carefully when people you have trusted have let you down. And I'm tempted to tell stories, but I dare not. I dare not. But you know you've been deeply betrayed or somebody who's been a close friend. And you remember Jesus said, and it was prophesied, he said, my familiar friend who I ate bread with, and if you live in our part of the world, to eat bread with somebody is almost sacred. There's a sacred law of hospitality. My familiar friend who I ate bread with has lifted up his heel against me that it were to kick me in the teeth when Jesus was on his knees uh, washing those feet, to kick him in the teeth. And our Lord felt that, and some of you have felt that. Now, that is the kind of thing that will devastate vision, particularly corporate vision. And you say, I can't trust myself to anybody anymore. Now, if you take that position, the enemy has won a double victory. He's not only injured you and wounded you once, he's now maneuvered you into a position of limited fruitfulness. Because we will never get 
where God is asking us to go unless we can totally link arms and get there together. You will not get there alone. And it took me a long time to learn that. I thought that Ray Mayhew was self-sufficient and spiritual enough and wise enough. And I had to go through a few tragedies to discover that unless I am locked into secure relationships, I cannot achieve the purposes of God for my life. Now there are some in this room and you feel betrayed. Now you've got to get that cleaned out of your spirit. Otherwise you will never, you will never get to the point of vision being born again in your hearts. Disappointments, betrayal and criticism. Criticism. Okay. Now if you've got a vision, you're going to be criticized. John Wesley, bless him, I was saying about his vision uh, yesterday. During John Wesley's lifetime, 606 tracts, booklets, and books were written against him and his movements. Can you imagine it? 606 written against him. Now, if you've got a vision from God, be prepared to be criticized. Okay? It's not too bad, really, if you know you're doing what God is telling you to do. And in fact, when John Wesley and his preachers used to move into a town, the townspeople used to come out and they used to sing this song. And they used to say, the Wesleyans are coming to town to try and burn the churches down. Okay, because they were simply going in saying it's not a building, it's spiritual reality. Okay, and they hated them. John Wesley's colleagues, one of them preaching in the open air with him, was hit by a stone and killed. Okay, so we can expect a little bit of flack. Do you say flack here? Flack is, you know, what they, what you kind of catch as your, I've never had it happen to me, but I've caught some spiritual flack, but not real, literal stuff. And in our movement in London uh, over the last year um, or two, we've had London newspapers write against our work, particularly some of the stands we've taken on morality in the city. And I suppose about 20 different uh, articles in various newspapers have been written against us. Well, praise the Lord. Jesus says, woe to you when all men speak well of you. And Alec was showing me an article just yesterday where somebody was criticizing this work. So be it. So be it. If we're going to irritate the enemy, we can expect some comeback. But, but, most of what you're battling with is not on that level. But somebody has said something. And it might have been eight years ago. And you're still not over it. And so what do we do? We build a little protective shield, okay? And nobody knows, but we're not really giving ourselves to what the Holy Spirit is saying. Not just personally, but as a body, as Bethany Missionary Church. And what the Holy Spirit is saying is if he's going to come among us in these days, as he will, that some of that has got to be washed away. You might need to know healing as somebody was praying. You might feel so wounded you can't get over it by yourself well then you must you must seek out help today today before you go to bed tonight if anything I'm saying is shining into your heart you're going to say now Lord Jesus you see it's not just for your blessing and for your healing but you are needed not one third of you you know not uh, 65 percent of you but you blazing and burning and ignited with the spirit of Jesus that's who you're needed to be in who we are together and where we're going as a company of people and so if you've built little protective shell around yourself that has got to come down if it's somebody in this room okay You've got to go and see them and put it right. Because then the Holy Spirit's going to come. And you see, the Holy Spirit will come, but the intensity with which he penetrates who we are is somewhat dependent upon our results. And I can always remember when I was a student, I was in my second year, 
and the team came from the Rwanda revival. This was in about 65, I think, Alec. Do you remember that big black brother who came? I can't remember his name, but I'll never forget him. And uh, they had come out of that great East African um, revival, and they ministered here uh, uh, to the fellowship for a week. And I'll never forget the story of how the revival began. And it was one missionary who couldn't sleep one night, and he was burdened to get right with his brother. And he knew he must, but he was resisting it. And finally, in the middle of the night, he said, Lord, I can't wait any longer. And he got up and he lit a torch. And he started to walk through the jungle path to meet this other brother. And this was way in the wee hours, walking along the path. He saw another torch coming towards him. And it was that brother. And they met and embraced. And neither of them could sleep because they had to get it right and when they got it right, the Holy Spirit fell. The Holy Spirit fell. And they would come to meetings not knowing if they were in heaven or on the earth. And that's how it was to the Moravian movements. And in many ways, I, I feel that Bethany is so close to what God did through the Moravians. So close in its ethos and spirit. And you remember that was birthed when uh, those refugees on Zinzendorf's estate, 1727, August. They gathered for the normal conference, the normal prayer time, and the Holy Spirit fell. And there were people praying in that chapel night and day, 24 hours a day, for over 100 years. Because the Holy Spirit came. Okay? They didn't stay in the chapel, some did. I guess they had to go in and out for meals or to get married or have children or, or whatever. Normal life continued, but there were people day and night seeking God. Why? Because they had put things right. There was lots of criticism in that community. It's very interesting to read it because Zinzendorf invited all these refugees to come in. And they were all living on his estate. But they were bickering. They were fighting. Uh, some of them felt they didn't have, you know good access to the community of goods and, and some were getting a little more than others and there was friction even though they were a community there was criticism and then the Holy Spirit came okay and that's what the Lord's doing among us in these days so number one deal with that number one deal with that number two and I think this is all or number three I think in our listing and this is all I'll have time uh, to deal with um, this morning I want to speak about the problem of dilution and drift dilution and drift because you see the enemy wants to dilute our vision now uh, in the UK we have something called squash which I think you call concentrate over here and it's what you use with the kids when you put in a little bit in the cup and then they, they fill it up with water. Do you call that concentrate or squash or whatever? And um, you know what it's like if you, put, if you put the right amount in, but if you've got a big glass and you put too much water in, it becomes tasteless. In fact, with my kids, I always have an argument about how much concentrate goes in the bottom of the glass, because they would like that much, and I say that much, so usually it comes out you know, somewhere in between, okay? because they really like to taste it. Now what can happen in a movement of God is the enemy can dilute vision. What he wants to do is rebirth it. It may not be, well the vision's the same, the mechanics of how to get there might be very different. One generation were living in tents fulfilling the vision of God. The next generation were putting up vines and building houses to fulfill the vision of God. You see, the vision of where we're going to touch the world, every kindred, tribe, tongue, nation for Christ, that will not change. The vision of the loveliness of Jesus that we meet on the Damascus Road. A light shines from heaven and we're spoilt for everything else but to love him and to know him and to serve him. That will never change. Our vision to love each other will never change. In three million years time we'll still know each other still be together some things don't change but how we achieve that vision must change of course it must but in the achieving of it the enemy will seek to dilute dilute our vision 
so it becomes insipid and tasteless. That's why Israel, three times a year, had to go to Jerusalem, and they read some of the scriptures um, that Dan was reading to us this morning. Their history, their mandate, where they were going as the people of God. And you see, when the Holy Spirit comes, it's to renew us, to cleanse us, to refresh us, so that vision might burn and blaze in our hearts again. Because the enemy wants to dilute it. The enemy wants us to drift. Dilution and drift. I fight them all the time. Now I'll tell you a secret. Those of you under 40, uh, this will be a total revelation for. Those of you over 40 uh, may sympathize with me. But when you reach the age of 40, which is a great landmark, okay, a wonderful time, uh, you begin to enjoy comfortable things. <laughs> I didn't really want you to say amen. I was just seeing if anybody was out there at that point. You begin to enjoy comfortable things. And when I was a student, um, I didn't mind. I went to conferences, OM conferences, where the only thing you got to sleep on was a piece of cardboard. Okay, they gave you a piece of cardboard on a concrete floor, that was it. And perhaps, you know, you could have some spinach for breakfast, but I always suspected it was grass, actually. Um, <laughs> but, but whatever. Um, but these things didn't matter, because something was throbbing and burning in our spirits. Now, there, I wish we could have a conference where people like Harold and Kathy and all the others could tell their stories. I would enjoy a conference like that. And the way these wonderful people lived to make this place possible. And why did they do it? Because there was vision birthed in their hearts. Now, I tell you something, when you nudge over 40, you begin to hope that when you come to speak at conference, Alec will not give you a piece of cardboard to sleep on in the print shop. You hope for something a little bit better than that. And you begin to enjoy nice things. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But you see, if that begins to insidiously creep in, okay, so that comfort becomes more important and security more important and success, you see, we are all desperate to be successful. It's, it's unfortunate. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to achieve God's purposes for your life. But we live in a society that is neurotic about success. We have just launched a new work in the Middle East. It's two and a half years old. And I will confess, I am very, very concerned that it's successful. I don't want it to fail. Okay? We're like that. Now, there's nothing wrong with that until success, security. I was with a couple of... Uh, a 22-year-old and a 19-year-old last week, and they were talking about how they were planning their financial security for when they were 65 years old. A 19-year-old and a 22-year-old. How they were planning their financial security for when they were 65 years old. Now, I don't say that that is wrong, okay? But all these things, if they begin to clutter that deposit of Christ, you see, that's what it means to regain your first love. That suddenly all the debris, all the cares of this world, all the clutter, that's revival when the Spirit of God begins to blow away the clutter and the chaff. And we suddenly arrive where really we've always wanted to be, which is simply in the presence of Jesus, loving Him with a pure heart a sense of the anointing of the Spirit, and sharp, precise vision about where we're going and who we are. Now, at this point, you can give an amen, please. Amen. amen. So, that's all I'm saying for this morning. Buts, buts. I'm not finished. I will finish in a couple of minutes. But the Holy Spirit has spoken to us this morning. He's spoken to me. He's spoken to you. Okay, now today we do something about it. This afternoon we do something about it. So if you're 
running a print shop, a print, running a print press this afternoon, as the papers are going through, you'd be saying, Lord Jesus, move by your spirit. Lord Jesus, I open my heart to you. Okay? You're with, with the kids, okay, at home, got to cook the evening meal. As you're doing it, say, Lord Jesus, this is a time of visitation. Come by your spirit. Move in our midst. Get to the prayer meetings if you can. Okay? We'll be praying at four o'clock this afternoon here. Now, again, we don't want to put each other into condemnation. Okay, we're not up to, nobody's going to be looking to see if you've come to a prayer meeting. That's not it, you see. That's legalism. That grieves the spirit. It doesn't bring him. Okay? But if your heart is hungry, if your heart is hungry, let's just be almost, ask the, the Holy Spirit so to, to brood, so to brood over Bethany, that there's almost a, a hush, almost a hush, because the Spirit of God is brooding in our midst. Let's pray. Lord, you know what's in our hearts for these days. You know, Lord, who we are. You know, Lord, that some of us have really got to make some decisions now about putting some things right. And we ask, Lord, strengthen us that we might not be like the ten who turn back, but that we would be the Joshua's and the Caleb's of our day who say we are well able. We are well able. And so, Lord, come and strengthen our hearts and brood by your Holy Spirit in our midst, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.